Hi, I'm Andrew, and this is Keen on Democracy. A chill is enveloping the world. Everywhere I go these days, the conversation is the same. Everyone is fearful about the fate of democracy in our digital age. The same worried question is on all of our lips. What or who is killing democracy? Everybody wants to know. There's certainly no lack of suspects. Trump, Putin's trolls, Mark Zuckerberg, authoritarian populism, the wall, Viktor Urban, fake news, Brexit, Bolsonaro, surveillance capitalism, Erdogan, Twitter, or last but certainly not least, the president of the People's Republic of China, Xi Jinping. So what's up with democracy these days? Is it really dying? Or is it simply shedding its industrial analog skin and updating itself for our networked digital age? That's the subject of this podcast series. This is a show featuring conversations about the most important issue of our age with some of the world's most incisive thinkers. I hope it both provokes and enlightens. The American technology journalist and impresario David Kirkpatrick is probably the world's leading authority on the history of Facebook. The author of the 2010 best-selling The Facebook Effect, a generally positive take on the social network's early history based in part on his close access to Mark Zuckerberg, Kirkpatrick has, over the last few years, become one of Facebook's most articulate critics. So I began by asking David Kirkpatrick if he felt personally let down by Facebook's behavior over the last decade. So David Kirkpatrick, perhaps the world's leading authority on Facebook, you wrote the Bible or the original Bible on Facebook, (laughs) the Facebook effect in 2010. But since then, David, you've dramatically changed your mind on Facebook and indeed on the book. How does it feel? Do you feel personally let down by Facebook, given that I think it would be fair to say that you were pretty enthusiastic in your 2010 book, The Facebook Effect, about the potential of Facebook of remaking the world and particularly democracy? And today, you're much more critical and pessimistic. Well, I feel very disappointed that they failed to anticipate the harms that their service could cause alongside the virtues that it brought to the world. And uh, so, yes, in that sense, I feel let down. But let's face it, with Facebook, it's not by a company, it's by a person. I mean, this is a company that is a unilateral dictatorship. And Mark Zuckerberg is the decision maker. And he chose not to focus or to prioritize the issues of potential harm and instead go for growth at all costs. And that is really the single biggest reason why we find ourselves at this time with so many things going wrong. That's an interesting response, David. Sheryl Sandberg doesn't matter. Everything at Facebook is all about Zuckerberg. Well, Sheryl Sandberg doesn't control the company. She works for him. She does matter. I think she's she's made errors too. I think, you know, the thing that I find ironic about Cheryl, and I respect them both in many ways, and, you know, I, I try not to make ad hominem attacks on either one of them, although the problems that their service has caused the world are so severe in so many instances that it's hard not to be deeply disappointed in them as people. That's a pretty radical thing to say, disappointed in them as people. Explain that. Well, let me just explain what I was going to say about Cheryl. I mean, Mark hired her. He told me when I was reporting my book, which happened to be right around the time he had hired her, that he brought her in partly because of her government experience. And this is a more or less an exact quote, and the quote is in the book, because she had government experience and running Facebook was going to be increasingly like running a government, which was a profound insight that was accurate. But ironically, that is not what she did. Instead of bringing her government experience to bear and trying to implement governance-like reforms and structures inside the system, she built one of the best businesses that has ever been built in a generally heedless manner. They could have built a good ad business with a lot more controls and protective features and probably not been as profitable as they are but it would have worked, in, I believe, and they wouldn't have grown as quickly. But they chose to grow at all costs. The irony is that you know he 
said she had government experience. Facebook was going to be like a government, so he needed her. But she has not functioned as you know a government kind of figure inside the company. She's functioned as a cheerleader for a purely uh, you know exploitive capitalist uh, business model. So is Facebook the epitome of what Shoshana Zuboff called surveillance capitalism? Is that the best summary of the model? And is that essentially what's gone wrong with the company? I think if Facebook is not the only example of surveillance capitalism. I mean, surveillance capitalism is a macro phenomenon that we're in the midst of that goes well beyond Facebook. It extends to the camera-based society. Of course, YouTube, Google, um, all these messaging services, particularly in China, WeChat, and there's plenty of other ways that surveillance capitalism or, or non-capitalism is harming the world and, and impairing our, our freedom of action. Rather than thinking of surveillance capitalism, though, I am more along the lines of Tristan Harris's analysis in which he talks about the predatory database advertising model, which is attention-based and depends on essentially disrupting the user's life in order to profit for the vendor, the advertising platform. However, I, I don't like Tristan, I don't, who is a friend of mine, I don't have a simple answer or he doesn't have a simple answer. Roger McNamee tends to have a somewhat simpler answer, which is that he says they shouldn't be allowed to use that business model, which strikes me as impractical uh, because I just don't see how you get from here to there. It's the surveillance part that is certainly is a big part of it, but it's not just that they're surveilling us. It's that they're surveilling us for their own profit, and therefore they have no incentive to stop surveilling us. Well, Zuboff actually was on the show, and she suggests that it was Sandberg who imported the surveillance capitalist business model from Google to Facebook. I think McNamee also agrees with that. I wouldn't disagree with that. So why is Zuckerberg so important then if, if Sandberg is the pioneer of this corrosive business model? Look, I blame Sheryl Sandberg a lot for bringing that business model in and not stopping to think about some of the consequences. I do think both of them have gotten drunk on the money, and I think we definitely should get around to the money and the profit aspects of this in a minute. But it is technically accurate that before Cheryl arrived, there was, in effect, no business model. And I write in my book two chapters about what happened after she arrived and how they sat around, you know, and she would write on a whiteboard, what business are we in? They didn't even know what business they were in. They didn't know how they were going to make money. That had not been Mark's priority. And Cheryl figured it out. And she figured it out in a way that was enormously profitable. And she executed it with some strategic brilliance, if you forgive her the oversight that I'm not forgiving her for, which is doing it without considering the consequences on society. Yeah, she brought a targeted ad-based business model with her from Google. And that's what they used. So David, in your memorable book, uh, The Facebook Effect, you describe a political uprising in Colombia. I think it was written, what, a year or two before the Arab Spring? A year before. But your presentation of Facebook was as a kind of engine of democracy. Did you have a moment over the last eight years where you recognized that Facebook wasn't this engine of democracy? Did it suddenly dawn on you? Well, I think when I was interviewing Mark Zuckerberg on stage at Techonomy two days after the election, and he said it's a crazy idea that fake news on Facebook affected the election of Donald Trump, that was a revelatory moment for me. And processing it in subsequent weeks and the world's reaction to it was a pretty big force on my thinking. Although I had already been quite concerned and had written things prior to that about how worried I was about the sheer power these companies were gaining vis-a-vis -vis governments. But, you know, I wouldn't entirely agree with your formulation because the way I talked about it in my book was not exactly as a force for democracy, but a force for the empowerment of the individual. That is a distinction. It can translate into being a force for democracy, and it often has. And you know, contrary to your way of looking at it, I think, it still does in many ways. The problem is, it is also a force for anti-democracy. It depends on what the empowered individuals are trying to accomplish. If the empowered individuals are trying to work for, you know, the election of Barack Obama or the promotion of the Me Too movement or any other thing that we might consider socially, you know, admirable or, or progressive or whatever, it does work in those contexts. And it's used in those contexts in innumerable instances every day. So it still has that quality. 
But it also has the quality when a dishonest user, when people who have evil and malicious intent want to abuse the system, it unfortunately, it lends itself very readily to that abuse, which is why, you know, I know you're interested in the future of democracy, why we get Orban, Duterte, Bolsonaro, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's one of the main reasons those figures have become such major forces on the world stage, because they are all masters of abusing social media, and in particular, Facebook, because the rules don't prevent them from doing so. So you're suggesting that the Bolsonaros and the Erzigans and the Duertes of the world, the Orbans, they're cheats, that they're abusing Facebook, they're not using it legitimately? Every one of those is a cheat and an abuser of Facebook. Absolutely, unequivocally, provably. That is well known. There's plenty of evidence in each of those cases, and it's true uh, in Poland for the you know anti-democratic forces that are you know on the rise there and in the government there. It's true in many other countries in Eastern Europe in the Orban orbit because he has a lot of vassal states that are arising around him. It's true in many countries of the world, including Vietnam and elsewhere, where the governments know. And look, at the best example, ultimately, the most widely discussed one is Myanmar, where the junta, the military junta, used it to perpetrate genocide. And they did it with you know, fake news and incendiary speech that was uh, intended to rouse people towards violence. You can't really rouse people towards violence by honestly using the system in most cases. You probably can in some instances, but, you know, in Myanmar, in Sri Lanka, in Philippines, just to take Southeast Asia, it's very easy to concoct sensational messages that are inaccurate or dishonest that aim to inspire people to hate uh, someone that is politically advantageous for the you know person doing the manipulating. One good example of how this kind of thing works is the way that Duterte continues to target Maria Ressa, mm. the famous and brave journalist in the Philippines. And he has an entire team of hundreds and hundreds, probably thousands of people who basically only use social media to stir up trouble day in and day out. And this is true in India, too. The party in power in India has used these means. They have employed thousands of people who create whatever incendiary message they can to achieve their political goals, which is often to rouse people to fear and anger in order to support their political interests. Fear and anger, when it's invoked, leads people to support autocrats. That's like the simple formula. And it works. And you can generate fear and anger with fake messages in Facebook. David, was this model pioneered by Putin in Russia? Was the first politician who got it Putin? Putin has been using this kind of system to manipulate the Russian population for decades. He wasn't doing it first in Facebook. I don't think he was the first one. I think when he succeeded in doing it in order to help Donald Trump get elected, it led to a series of revelations for other political leaders around the world of what was possible. So in that sense, he was the teacher. I think Duterte, for example, is one who kind of figured it out on his own. Unfortunately, all of the controversy that surrounded Cambridge Analytica and the Russian manipulation inside Facebook during the campaign on 2016, the coverage that got globally was revelatory to politicians in many, many countries. And it taught them things. It didn't teach them that you shouldn't do it. It taught them that you could, and therefore, from their standpoint, you should do it. So, David, how do we fix this? Is it fixable? If Mark Zuckerberg was to take a call or Cheryl was to take a call from you, what would you tell them to do? It is fixable, but it's not fixable while maintaining a company with 40% plus net margins, which is what Facebook has. I would like to state something that I routinely say in public because very few people digest the significance of it. Facebook on a per dollar of revenue basis, is the most profitable large company that has ever existed. Wow. That is not an overstatement. Facebook has after-tax profit margins in the vicinity of 40%. And even maybe now they're in the high 30s. I don't know what they are. But you know, Google's net margins are in the 25% and below range. Before Facebook started doing any remediation, say before two years ago, Facebook was routinely having net after-tax margins of 43 to 45%. That means for every dollar of revenue, 
after they paid for everything they took to run the system, all the salaries, all the taxes, they kept 45 cents. That is unbelievable profitability. So you can't maintain that and fix the system. The well-run system would not be so profitable. By the way, before we go to the, back to the remediation, my fundamental criticism of Zuckerberg and Sandberg is they prioritize making that much money. The biggest lie that they promulgate is that they don't try to make so much money. I mean, it was, if you listen to this interview that was done at the code conference of the two Facebook executives by Casey Newton, they are reiterating it, both of them. You know, we're not rapacious capitalists. We don't think about making money. It's such disingenuous rhetoric to say, we aren't the people trying to make tons of money. We're just doing this when they are the most profitable company of their scale that ever existed. It's insulting to every other business to say they're not trying hard to make money. I mean, because they're doing it better than anybody else. And they also keep saying, well, it just sort of happened. We didn't do, we were too slow to see all these harms coming. The reason they were too slow was that they were drunk on the wealth they were generating, drunk on the stock appreciation they were every single one of them individually benefiting from. So do they know they're lying? Are they consciously lying or are they deluding themselves? They're deluding themselves. They are deluding themselves. They think institutionally and individually, we don't appreciate all the good things that Facebook brings to the world. And the world is unfair in our criticism of them because we are only focusing on the negative. The positive overwhelmingly outweighs the negative, but we don't see that because the negative is more sensational. That's what they think. They say, yes, we were slow, and yes, we need to do more, and yes, we made a lot of mistakes. In fact, even in that, that interview I'm referring to at the Code Conference, I think Bosworth says they were Pollyanna-ish until last year, which is a gentle way of saying the truth. They were worse than Pollyanna-ish. They were willfully ignorant of the potential negatives because they were so eager to keep growing and making money. You know, there's an element of only the paranoid survive where they felt if they didn't grow fast, somebody else would eat their lunch. I understand that, but they should have been willing to tolerate that risk in order not to create all this enormous range of harms that they've engendered. So has the time come, David, for the, the regulators to step in? It sounds to me, in terms of at least your presentation, that these people are congenital liars. I didn't say they were congenital liars. I said they are self-delusional. Well, you said they were lying. To say they're congenital liars would be to presume that they're willfully lying. I do think willful lies do emerge periodically, but I don't think of them as congenital liars. I think their delusions can be traced back to their wealth. I mean, if you look at Zuckerberg personally, the richest 35-year-old in human history, by far, it's pretty easy to think, if I'm this rich, I must be smarter than everybody else, and they just don't get it, and I'm entitled to keep doing what I'm doing. And anyway, I'm going to give it away and cure all diseases so I deserve the money. I think that kind of wealth is distortive intrinsically. It makes it very hard for people to step back and make a rational assessment of the impact of their behavior. I'm not saying necessarily I know how to regulate it, but I will guarantee you regulation is coming. That is very apparent. All across the world, the governments are stepping up. They are not going to sit back anymore. I mean, if you look, for example, at the Democratic presidential candidates, every single one of them has a position on the regulation of social media, and the majority of them say yes when asked the question, should these services be broken up? So that is a major sea change that's really only happened in the last six to nine months. As you say, they're the most profitable company in history. Couldn't they just employ armies of curators to make sure that the Duartes and the Bolsonaros and Putins of the world don't cheat the system? Yeah, I think in some sense, that's what they have to do. And they are starting to do that. You know, they brag about the 30,000 curators they have now. And Casey Newton, again, at The Verge, has done these extraordinary articles about the suffering those people encounter, just trying to look at all these suicides and sexual depravity and child pornography, all this awful stuff that they have to look in at day in and day out. And there aren't nearly enough of them. But unfortunately, even if they were to employ hundreds of thousands, which maybe they should, it would still not be completely sufficient. I do believe, in effect, they are a media company. And in effect, they bear responsibility for the content that runs on their services. And they've acknowledged this in some ways, and they continue to deny the idea that they should be considered a media company. And if you accept that, it does imply enormous additional expense in order to monitor the content and to take a lot more stuff down 
to be much more vigilant. You know, they can employ software, so it's not just a person body's issue, but it will be enormously costly. And it should be because the world demands it. The world safety and future of social harmony in some ways depends on it. This is the town square of the planet. You know, they are controlling speech for a large portion of the planet. And whatever it costs, they should spend the money to do that responsibly. Not only are they the town square of the planet, but this week they announced they wanted to be the bank of the planet. What do you make of this Libra initiative, their cryptocurrency initiative, bringing in 27 partners and announcing that they were going to empower the poorest people of the world with a Facebook-branded cryptocurrency? As their initiatives go, I'm much less critical of this one than most of their others. I think it's true the world needs a more affordable way for money to flow across borders, especially in a world where the number which just came out this week that 700 million people are displaced. I mean, we are moving toward a world of migration that, you know, is unprecedented and a tremendous suffering results. And you have all these people who are migrant workers trying to send money back to their families at home, and they pay these enormous fees to do that. That is something that they could help with the system. So I'm actually kind of agnostic about Libra as a currency, as a financial innovation. I'm not a financial expert. I think it's a legitimate thing to experiment with. I generally accept that they have turned over governance of this to this Libra Association. And I don't think that it will be under the entire control of Facebook. They do have the ability to profit from it with their own implementation of the currency if it were to take off and be successful. There's many uncertainties about it, so it's by no means a slam dunk. What I think is interesting about it, and I wrote a piece on Techonomy, and I also published it on LinkedIn about this, which hasn't really been commented by others, that the whole set of innovations that surround this Libra currency could be applied inside Facebook itself to help address the advertising problem, depending on how hard governments start to push back against the targeted attention-based advertising business model. There is a potential for a different business model that one could envision, which Libra could potentially point towards implementation of. And I could explain that if you want. It's a very subtle but important point, and uh, I think they're possibly thinking about this in the background, although they're not talking about it. The piece is actually extremely interesting. You say that Libra could help Facebook, I'm quoting you here, remake itself. What would that mean? They'd entirely drop the advertising model and and replace it with a a currency-based business model? Nothing's ever entire. I think it could be partial. It could be incremental. But it's possible that Facebook could really find social pressure growing against this targeted advertising model that they have, which depends on the exploitation of our personal data. And again, if they were to do what I'm proposing is possible here, they would probably not be nearly as profitable as they are today. So it would be a wrenching transition. Wall Street would punish them. Who knows? They might have to be taken private in the process. All kinds of you know weird things might have to happen. But there is a way you could do a business model differently. And it would be where you essentially give the data, the control of our personal data back to all of us individually and in effect pay us for seeing commercial messages. This is a model that many people have found appealing for a number of years. The architecture to implement it has never properly existed, but it is widely believed that a blockchain-based model could give people the ability to control their personal data in a sort of encapsulated form. If you look at Facebook's description of the Libra Association in their white paper, there is a paragraph in which they say that they are hoping to develop a digital identity as part of this system, which they say is urgently needed. Now, a digital identity is ironically what up to now Facebook provided better than anybody else. But unfortunately, it was a digital identity for us that was controlled by Facebook. The kind of digital identity I'm talking about is a digital identity for us controlled by us. You know, if you poke around in in the blockchain community, there's a lot of people talking about this kind of thing. You know, it's been sort of seen as pie in the sky. If Libra took off and did become a global system, that kind of idea would no longer be so pie in the sky. The elements would be in place for Facebook to potentially start experimenting with and even potentially eventually implement this kind of a system. And the other element that the Libra system would enable is micropayments. So that in other words, 
if Coca-Cola wants to show Andrew Keen and or David Kirkpatrick an ad, to some extent, maybe they would pay us some fraction of a Libra in order to look at that ad instead of paying all that money to Facebook as they do today. It's a way of sharing the wealth with the users, with the citizens of the system. I read the white paper too, and I'm quoting the introduction, the, the, the mission statement. It says, Libra's mission is to enable a simple global currency and financial infrastructure that empowers billions of people. Aren't we falling back into the old trap of Facebook equating its own interests with the interests of humanity? Can we really trust them again, given they've screwed up so many times in the past? In general, I don't trust them. That's a fact. But as I hear this particular project described, and as I see them saying they're going to hand over governance of it to an entirely outside entity that they will not have disproportionate influence over, if that were the way it actually develops, that could be a trustable architecture. But in general, do I trust Facebook to do what's right for the citizens of the world? No, I do not. They have proven themselves untrustworthy. So in that sense, I agree with you. This is the crisis, isn't it, of Facebook, is for them to reinvent themselves or perhaps even survive in the long term, they need to rebuild trust. But that's their core problem, is that we've given up trusting them because they've let us down so many times in the past. So how do they find their way out of that? Well, it's hard to know, but I would reiterate that this, this idea of a sovereign digital identity that was controlled by the individual and a micropayments architecture, which would lead payments to go to the individual when their attention is interrupted by an ad or whatever other activity that was imposed upon them, that could be a way to build a more trusted architecture. You know, it's another one of those challenging problems where how do you go from here to there? But I think the interesting thing to me, alongside the pure currency aspects of Libra, which I think potentially are legitimate in themselves, is that it could create the context for that to begin to develop at scale in a way that would benefit Facebook. And they would only do it if they had to. They don't do anything unless they have to. If all this controversy after the election of Donald Trump hadn't occurred, they wouldn't be doing anything different. They're only doing everything in all this response to the world's concerns because the world is concerned. It's proven that they didn't do the governance when they weren't being scrutinized. It's only scrutiny by the public and governments that gets them to do anything positive. That's an exaggeration. I do think there are positive elements to their system, and I'm not going to eliminate that from my own rhetoric. I believe there are things about Facebook that still are very valuable for citizens of the world and, and the United States. In general, the reforms that they're introducing now are entirely reactive. So you don't trust them to do the right thing because they have proven that they will allow harms to develop when left alone. Okay, David, final question, impossible question, of course. You've been very, very honest here, and now I want you to speculate. It's nine years since you wrote The Facebook Effect. Of course, when you wrote it in 2010 or when it came out in 2010, I can't imagine you would have even conceived of, of the situation today in 2019. But let's fast forward another nine years to 2028. What will Facebook look like then? I know it's impossible to say, but speculate. I would guess that there will be other systems that compete in some fundamental way with Facebook by a decade from now or nine years from now. I think it's impossible to really say what those systems would look like because I think we're going to see all kinds of architectural changes in the digital landscape with the much more computation everywhere through the you know internet of things and 5G and the following that 6G i think you know augmented reality could be affecting our experience of digital architectures much more by then unfortunately i think governments will be far more involved then than they are now and most likely the global digital landscape will be far more fragmented and i'm not advocating that but i'm sad to say i think it's likely so the idea of a single global system, which Facebook is today, might be effectively impossible in a decade. So they may be weakened simply by that alone. And democracy, David, in 2028, is it going to be stronger or weaker than it is today? You know, I'm a hopeful optimist. The trends right now for democracy are very worrisome, as you know. I will not predict that we will have less democracy in 10 years. I simply won't because I'm going to work to make sure that doesn't happen. But it's possible. You're listening to Keen on Democracy with your host, Andrew Keen. 
Hello, I'm Jason Sanderson, the producer of the show. Now we're about to take a quick break while we hear from our sponsors. But please stick around as Andrew will be right back to conclude this episode with his five takeaways. Hi, my name is Steffi Czerny and I'm the founder of the DLD Conferences. DLD is short for Digital Life Design and explores how the digital age fundamentally changes our world. Founded in Munich in 2005, DLD is now a globally connected community of thinkers, doers, and communicators. We host conferences in Munich, New York, Tel Aviv, Singapore, and Brussels. And we are very proud of our interdisciplinary outlook and even more so of our track record of discovering trend topics early on. Andrew Keane is a long-time, long-term DLD friend who has done many interviews at DLD conferences. If you like this podcast, you should join one of our events. Our motto for this year is optimism and courage. We want to put a really positive spin on recent technological developments from AI through blockchain to quantum computing and discuss which impact they have on business as well as politics and society. Visit our website at dld.co and apply for your ticket. Thanks so much for sticking around. Now here's Andrew with his five takeaways from this interview. This is an important interview. As I suggested in the introduction, David Kirkpatrick is probably the world's leading authority on the history of Facebook. He's also amongst the most respected tech commentators in the world. Kirkpatrick, then, is anything but a radical critic of Silicon Valley. Anything but a Luddite. And yet, in this refreshingly frank interview, Kirkpatrick pulls no punches about Facebook. And that's what makes his critique so important. Yes, he admits, he does feel let down, in his words, deeply disappointed by Facebook. Mark Zuckerberg, in particular, he argues, is to blame for Facebook's failure to admit the enormous range of harms it's done to society. That's because, Kirkpatrick says, Zuckerberg and his deputy, Sheryl Sandberg, went for economic growth at all costs. The company and its platform was thus built on what he calls a heedless manner, which didn't respect its users' rights. Facebook is, in many ways, a classic morality tale, David Kirkpatrick says. The company executives, Zuckerberg, Sandberg and their team, got quite literally drunk on the company's 40% margins, making it the most profitable company in history. But that profitability is rivaled by its greed and by Zuckerberg's failure to confront the ethical implications of his company's success. The culture at Facebook was delusional, Kirkpatrick suggests. Nobody was willing to tell the truth. Kirkpatrick unambiguously connects the contemporary crisis of democracy with Facebook. Illiberals like Orban in Hungary, he claims, have become masters of manipulating Facebook, stimulating fear and anger to undermine democracy. Autocracies such as Duete's regime in Philippines, he says, have teams of trolls employed to cheat the system. In Myanmar, he suggests, it seems Facebook might even have been used to enable genocide. So how to fix Facebook? Just as money is the problem, so it could be the answer too. Facebook is ultimately, Kirkpatrick reminds us, a media company with all the accountability of traditional media companies. It should, therefore, bear moral responsibility for what exists on its platform. And so the most effective way to combat Duete's trolls is to hire editors to catch the cheats hired by the autocrats. Regulation matters too, he tells us. But fixing Facebook, Kirkpatrick believes, is ultimately an economic rather than political challenge. Facebook's big data business model might be fatally flawed, Kirkpatrick hints. But it's here that he senses a glimmer of opportunity with Libra, the company's new cryptocurrency initiative announced with great fanfare last week. Libra, Kirkpatrick hopes, 
could offer Facebook the opportunity to invent a new business model in which it would share its wealth with its users by giving them control over their own data. I'm not so sure, however. Like David Kirkpatrick, I read the Libra white paper published last week. What worries me, however, is that Facebook seems as delusional as ever. Libra's mission is to enable a simple global currency and financial infrastructure that empowers billions of people. Zuckerberg and his team modestly introduced its plans for this new cryptocurrency. Once again then, Facebook is presenting itself as an altruistic company that will make the world a better place. And once again, the company is lying. No, we aren't going to fall for that one again. Are we? Now, we've got a real big favour that we need to ask. If you like this episode and you've been enjoying the other interviews, we'd sure love it if you headed over to the iTunes podcast app and leave us a review. If you'd like to hear more episodes, there's a subscribe button there and in all of the platforms like Spotify, Overcast and Google Play. So head over to one of those, subscribe, leave us a review, share it with your friends if you'd like, and we'd appreciate it so much. Be sure to check out our next episode every Thursday. And from all of us at Keenan Democracy, we hope you have a fantastic day.